Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Doc Talk with Monument Health. My name is Mark Houston, and joining me today is Dr. Abdel Azuga, who is a hematologist and oncologist at Monument Health Cancer Care Institute. Welcome to the show, doctor. Thanks Thank for coming you. Thank in. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, first off, I have to ask how, because uh, I've talked to a lot of the doctors uh, that have come from, uh, I think there's a handful that work in, uh, that have come from Jordan as well that work at Monument. Yes. I just got to know how you ended up in the Midwest of the United States. It <laughs> fascinates me to find out how you guys get here. Yeah. So good question. <laughs> so basically, yeah, I did my medical school in Jordan. Um, then I moved to the United States in 2013 to do my residency. Um, and of course, you know, growing up in, um, you know, in Jordan, you know that uh, you, you, the United States is the best place for, uh, you know, developing the science of medicine and medicine, and that's the place to be to train. So that I think I matched a Cleveland clinic, went to Cleveland, stayed there for uh, three years for my internal medicine uh, residency mm -hmm. training. So that's my first view of the Midwest. Then I uh, went to Jacksonville, Florida at Mayo Clinic. I did my fellowship there for three years. And then when I was looking for a hematology oncology job, uh, I interviewed at multiple places all around, all around the country, did a pros and cons list, <laughs> and um, basically uh, regional health or monument health uh, ended up in one of the higher spots. Yeah. And, uh, after counseling, uh, taking counsel by my wife, we decided to come to Rapid City, <laughs> South Dakota, and we loved it ever since, since that's, we've been here. That's excellent. You said you've been here about uh, about five years, I believe, haven't yes, you? Sir. Yeah. yeah. So you've gone through all the winters, and uh, you had mentioned that, did you, did you, for the first time, pick up snowmobiling as a hobby just by being <laughs> out here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, I mean, we, we tried to do some winter sports being here. Yeah. And, and sn snowmobiling was was fun, a fun one to do. Yeah. I suppose that. Do you ski then at all? Haven't tried that yet. N not yet. I need to take lessons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very smart thing to do. <laughs> yeah. So many people be like, well, how hard can it be? You just point them down the hill and you go, <laughs> right? Um, well, uh, it's like I said, it's great to have you on here, doctor. Um, uh, can you just really quickly? A lot of people, most people that listen right now, know what an oncologist is. Somebody who studies it's a, you're, it's a cancer related field. Uh, but the hematologist part of it, what what specifically is that, doctor? Yeah. So it's blood disorders mainly. And um, in the United States, most of the training programs for oncology include hematology as well. So most doctors who are oncologists or cancer doctors are double boarded and they're hematologists as well. Okay. So it's basically blood disorders. And there's a, a lot of um, kind of interconnectedness between blood disorders and blood cancers. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's it's part of the same training. So when you were looking to become a doctor, was was cancer specializing in cancer care something you were interested in, or right away, or did you, did something else lead you to it? Yeah, uh, not not directly. Mm -hmm. um, as part of my medical school training, um, kind of initially the thought about cancers was like, oh, it's a it's maybe a depressing field, maybe that's not for me. But in Jordan, as part of my uh, training, I did a year of a transitional residency at a, a place called King Hussein Cancer Institute. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked there for a year. And during my time there, that's when I got to know, you know, got to work with cancer patients and cancer doctors. And you find kind of of a calling, sort of a calling to, to that field is that, you know, patients in their most time of need. Yeah. And that's the specialty that other doctors shy away from. And you feel it's, it's maybe something you need to venture into because patients need help in that field. Well, and that's, that'll kind of lead into what we wanted to talk about here, too. You mentioned that uh, you thought it might be kind of a depressing area when you first thought about going into it, right? But I think something that's, that, that's exciting, that must be exciting for you as a doctor, is when you get into the clinical trials for cancer, right? Is that, is that as a, an exciting part of your job? Because it, it's almost, that's, that's, that's what's giving hope to these people, isn't it? Definitely. So as, as part of medicine, how the science advances is through these clinical trials. 
So these are the trials that try new substances or older substances to see what work works mm-hmm. best for cancer patients. And it's definitely over the last, you know, uh, maybe 20 years have accelerated in a way that's I, I didn't imagine. And it's definitely exciting, provides hope for patients and, and physicians alike. Yeah, that has, yeah, it has to be. It has to be something you look forward to almost every day. Um, how do the how do the, the these these clinical trials kind of fit into the overall cancer research process? Yeah. So the research process in general starts from um, a lab or cell cultures transitions into animals. Then you do. Uh, there are multiple phases of trials. In human trials are phase one, phase two, phase three. So phase one is first in human trials uh, that basically you're trying, is this substance toxic? What's the appropriate dosage of that substance you're trying to study? Then that transitions, if the substance is promising, into a phase two trial, which is a little bit bigger of a trial to try to see establish the toxicities pretty well. You already kind of know what dosage you want to use and try to get a signal of efficacy or effectiveness. Mm-hmm. And then you transition into phase three trials, and that's the bigger trials that on a bigger patient population. By that time, you already know the toxicities, the dosage, and you want to try to study the effectiveness of it, whether it, of increasing survival or increasing time of control of the cancer. Now, are you what do you specifically do you specialize in a specific type of cancer research or cancer care? I never. Uh, I didn't ask you that originally here. Yeah, n- not really, because of our community needs. Most of us oncologists here do everything. Okay. And participate in, across clinical trials, but uh, uh, most of our trials are phase two or phase three tr- trials because that's the support system we have here. So, if somebody has, let's say, somebody find finds out they have cancer. Um, there must be some cancers that you already know how to treat uh, and know what works more effective. But for these trials, is it are you still trying to improve upon what's already out there? or or are you discovering new cancers sometimes too that you're like, oh boy, what's this? We need to start we need to look into this. Yeah, there are multiple types of trials. Most of the trials we do are trying to improve on the standard of care that we have here. And that's, of course, a, a, a never-ending process. Yeah. So most of these trials that we participate in, they compare, they have two arms of the trial. One is the standard of care, is what we do right now for this cancer. The other arm is an investigational arm, trying to see if this new substance or a different substance or a different combination would work better than the, what we have as a standard of mm-hmm. care. Um, so most of them, it's not because we don't know how to treat the cancer. It's can something else be better? Is there, this might be a little bit off topic, but it just popped into my head when you say this, is with, I, I know there's, there's how many different types of cancer are there? Hundreds, isn't it? Yeah. Or more? Yeah. If yeah. more. Probably. Do they, is, is there, is there, do they all follow though a simple, not a simple, but are, are they similar enough in a way that Boy, I don't know how to ask this question now that it just when it popped into my head. Um, are 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 they different, or are they so different that you that you that you that you always have to take a new approach? They're definitely a lot more different than than the same. Okay. Oh, um, that, that's that's the answer I think I was looking for. Then. Yeah. 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 So each cancer behaves in a different way. Have a, uh, they have different biologies, um, and it's of course a big area of research. You know, our approach to cancers from the day uh, uh, treating cancer started in the United States in the 1930s, initially they thought cancers kind of are abnormal growths. There's going to be one simple solution for all cancers. And that couldn't be more far from the true nowadays, that we know more about the biology of cancers and how cancers form. Uh, Basically, each cancer has its own type of biology, and even within the same cancer, nowadays we know that there are different mutations that happen in cancer, different behaviors, even within the same type of cancer, that it needs to be 
treated differently. And I'll give you like a historical example about breast cancer, for example. Uh, you know, initially when chemotherapy started for breast cancer, it started not knowing is it a hormonal-based cancer, not a hormonal-based cancer. Then hormonal therapies for breast cancer started, and most 85% of breast cancers are hormonal-based, so that was the first uh, breakthrough knowing, yeah, there are different types. Then in, in the 90s, they discovered another receptor called HER2 or HER2, which uh, used to be the worst type of breast cancer, but nowadays has a targeted therapy for it, and now they do better uh, mm -hmm. than even the average breast cancer patients. And even now, there being more receptors being discovered to try to treat breast cancer differently. So it went from a monolith to a multitude of different subtypes that you treat differently depending on the cancer characteristics. Okay. If so, that answers your yes, question. Yes, it does. I mean, that, that, that is, I think that is kind of exactly what I was asking. Um, well, let's go back to the trials, doctor. So let's say somebody, I mean, it could be somebody with breast cancer, I suppose, that you guys want to do clinical trials or start something new, right? So how would somebody... What, is, what would be one of the first steps people take to participate in a clinical trial? Yeah. So a clinical trial typically is trying to answer a very specific question. Okay. So it's not so, generalized then. It's, yeah, it's got it. very specific. And I'll tell you about one of the trials we okay. have for breast cancer. So for the HRER2 positive breast cancer, currently the standard of care, for example, is to do for part of these tumors that are big enough to do chemotherapy in combination with targeted therapy, then do surgery, then after surgery you decide which targeted therapy to finish for a year total. So one of the trials that we have for the specific patient who had big enough cancer to start with, to start with the standard chemo and targeted therapy approach, then do surgery. If there's still some cancer at the time of surgery, is to do the adjuvant therapy that's the standard called TDM1, for example, now. And the trial that we have is trying this standard of TDM1 versus the investigational arm of TDM1 plus another drug called tocatinib. I don't want to get into the nitty-gritty, right. but it's trying to know if the combination of drugs for this specific scenario, is it better than what we have as a standard? So that's the specific question that okay. we're trying to answer. Yeah. And what better means is that the cure rates are high are higher, or uh, the chances that cancer doesn't come back are higher. Basically, you don't right. want the cancer to come back. Right. So how do you how do you know if you're a good candidate for something like this? How would you know? Yeah, I mean the simplest answer is ask your oncologist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but each clinical trial have its own criteria for inclusion into the clinical trial and exclusion from a clinical trial. And even myself, I wouldn't know that on top of my head. Mm -hmm. So we have a dedicated research team that would review these criteria extensively uh, to know if that patient that we think might be a good fit for the trial would actually fit for the trial or not. And if a patient is really mo motivated and wants to know, uh, all these clinical trials have to be registered with, with the US government, mm -hmm. the NIH. So there's a website called clinicaltrials.gov that have all the available clinical trials in the United States, whether in South Dakota or elsewhere. And you can go see the inclusion and exclusion criteria. For most patients, it's more complex to know exactly if you're a candidate or not. Uh, the best way to know is to talk to your oncologist. Okay, so what are, the, what are some of the advantages then of getting into a clinical trial? Um, good question. So basically, what you're trying to achieve is, get, am I going to be in the next big thing or the next standard of care before it is the standard of care? That would be the, um, the benefit of mm -hmm. trying a clinical trial, is that this could be the future and I have access to it before it happens. Uh, of course, depending on the type of trial, uh, but what what you're trying to get, especially on the bigger trials, is that can I get a benefit of being on that trial? Right. The earlier, smaller trials are mainly in more, you've exhausted all options. There's nothing standard at this point. This is something new that might be beneficial. 
and you ah, want to try see. it. So okay. most of phase one trials are in that situation. Most f phase three trials is that you already know the substance is likely beneficial. Is it better truly than what we do right now? So is phase three, is that is that almost, how often does that, does it, does it not move past that? How often do phase three trials fizzle out? Did it, is it, I mean, is it a guarantee once you get to phase three or not? Yeah, not really, but um, it's a very good question and I don't have the exact number sure. on the top of my head. Um, but most fa phase three trials, I mean, it's very expensive to run a clinical right. trial, so you have to have a, a high suspicion that it's gonna be better than the standard. But I would say maybe and I don't know for sure, this is on top of my head, mm -hmm. anecdotal evidence that 50-50 of them w oh, would really? be beneficial and 50 would be yeah. at least uh, not better than the standard. Uh, rarely that it's worse than the standard. Sure. Do you ever have to go, so if it fails at that phase three, do you just go back and start over or is the whole trial kind of wiped out and you start with something completely different? So, um, while on the clinical trial, yeah. you've already done it. So if it fails, whether the drug is successful mm -hmm. or not, you kind of transition to the next best thing uh, I as see. a patient. Yeah. Okay. The trial eventually, if you know the trial doesn't work, gets scraped, the standards of care stays the same. So what are some disadvantages then to being part of a trial? Are there really any for, for people that want to give it a go? Yeah, depending on the phase of the trial, but the bigger trials, the phase three, and like anything in life, it has pros and cons. Right. The risks would be, for example, is the investigational agent more toxic? Am I going to experience more toxicity? And less of a risk, excuse me, is it going to be worse than what we do already? That's a rare occurrence. But these would be the main risks. Okay. Um, so how long do these usually take? How long is a clinic? I'm, I'm assuming they vary vastly, don't they? True, depending on what you're studying. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the phase three, three trials go long term, mm -hmm. as long as the patient is alive or... Oh, really? Uh, yeah, uh, or they might have a set endpoint depending on yeah. the disease process that you're studying. Okay. If it's a highly curable disease process, you might set up a 10 year time frame for your study. And that the protocol of the trial will clearly state that. Some of them are lifelong, some of them are for a year, some of them are for two years, depending on the disease process and what the investigator who writes the protocol is trying to get out of, the, out of that trial. So what, when, when a clinical trial is happening, what's your role in it? What are you doing? Yeah, so as a physician here and a principal mm -hmm. investigator, uh, basically to make sure all aspects of the trial are running well, and to try to get patients enrolled on these clinical trial, uh, trials. And um, basically, in, we're, we're involved in the selection process of getting the clinical trials open. Okay. So it starts from choosing the right clinical trial that we think it's a better fit for our community to making sure we're adhering to the protocol and running the protocol smoothly to enrolling patients on the clinical trial and hoping that the results are going to be good. Of so trial. do you determine what the trials are going to be or do they come from like a national database of trials or or how, do, how does that work like for, for a town like Rapid City? Yeah, there are multiple um, uh, options for trials. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the trials that, that we do are through a group called the Alliance Group, which is government funded a group of multiple co what we call cooperative group that the doctors write the protocols, it's called investigator initiated protocols, and trying to study something else. The other avenue of trials are through pharmaceutical companies. And uh, the pharmaceutical trials usually are a lot more involved and a lot more uh, tedious, but mm -hmm. they might offer also a bigger benefit. So these are the two main areas where we get the trials. Do you, do we, do you get a lot of participation from people around here? Do the trials seem to, to fill up? Do you get the people that you need to work with this? It depends on the trial. Okay. Um, and it depends on uh, our team's capabilities mm -hmm. at that time. We, we had trials that we enrolled a good number of patients on. There are some trials that we 
couldn't accrue patients on. Right. And it really depends on, on the type of clinical trial that you have and the support system that you have. But in terms of patients' participation, most of the patients I see are interested if we offer them a clinical trial. Oh, that's trial. excellent. Yeah, that's very good. Um, do you, what's, what's your outlook on this battle against cancer? Um, you know, we've taken obviously some, some huge steps. You've seen it just in your, in your career, right? Um, you know, I know a lot of people will tout the fact that there's, there's certain vaccines for cancer now, like I believe H. PV is is a vaccine you can take that can prevent cancer. Um, does that get the ball rolling to fight the rest of these? Does that give you hope that, you know, someday we're going to fix breast cancer and lung cancer and prostate cancer? <laughs> uh, do you feel that way? I, I'm definitely optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, every year there are more and more options for treatment that are, um, you know, being established. The way we're thinking about cancer is more detail-oriented, more on a biological level, that things are changing and changing quickly. Yeah. Uh, and it, that not, might not be the case for, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, and there's more than ever, uh, you know, doctors and scientists involved in research and the future. I'm hopeful the future and it for the future and it might look very different yeah and of course the holy grail of treating cancer is can we prevent it from ever happening mm -hmm. and there are some research in in that aspect and that's really exciting and of course you know you can't put your um uh, the, all, the, all of your eggs in the one cart basket. before the horse or yeah. whatever yeah, yeah i know where you're going well, that. Yeah. you need to look at different aspects of cancer and when can you intervene to uh, improve mm -hmm. the future, uh, but it's definitely exciting. Was there ever a clinical trial you were a part of that really surprised you and you were like, oh man, this is gonna work, this is gonna be amazing. Can you be specific with anything like that? Yeah, so uh, we still have a trial open uh, for all types of what we call solid tumors like breast, prostate, anything but not blood cancers. Okay for a very specific mutation called KRAS G12C. That mutation happens, for example, in 30% of lung cancer patients, and it happens at different frequencies of cancer. Regardless of the cancer type, if you had that mutation, you can participate in that trial. And um, the, the trial was, was a success. So basically that drug improved the, uh, the patient's lifespan and the time of control of the cancer better than the standard of chemo for almost all the diseases. Wow. So right now, for example, and this is just over the last couple of years, uh, in lung cancer for second line therapy, it's the standard of care for people who have that KRAS G12C mutation to do the drug that we participated mm -hmm. in that, in the, not the specific clinical trial, but in these types of clinical right. trials. And in colon cancer patients who have that specific mutation called KRAS G12C, the, the standard now is different for second line is now you can do that targeted therapy drug, which is an oral drug in combination with another IV, IV targeted therapy drug, and it's chemo-free regimen, and it's also improved outcomes. Wow. Do you ever go home at night and just pour a drink and sit back and think, ah, <laughs> That was a good day. <laughs> that has you to know, make you feel good. <laughs> you know, definitely there are, you know, good days and, and bad days. Yeah. Of course, you know, when you see good patient outcomes mm -hmm. and, you know, that's all oncologists want is their right. patients to do well and and have a, a good outcome. Yeah. <laughs> and some, some days it feels really good. That's great. And of course, the other... Uh, side of that coin is some days don't feel right. As good. <laughs> yeah. Now, where can you give the uh, can you give the address again for where they can find clinical trials, doctor? Yeah. So, uh, if a patient is interested in general to look mm -hmm. for clinical trials, you can go to a website called clinicaltrials.gov. Okay. And you can search by geographic area or cancer type or a specific keywords that you are looking for, 
and that will include all the clinical trials in the United States. Excellent. And then that'll put you in touch with hopefully somebody like you, because uh, you've made me a lot more confident uh, now. <laughs> yeah. Just talking to you, doctor, this this feels better. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate Knowing that it. these are the things that you're doing and, and the stuff that just can happen locally here. That's that's reassuring. We don't have to go to Denver. We don't have to go to Minneapolis or Rochester or Phoenix. You know, we have Monument Health here that, uh, you know, that keeps you in your home when this stuff is going on. Yeah, and definitely. And over my five years here, I've noticed, you know, uh, all of our physicians, the drive is to try to keep the care to the highest level in our community. Yeah. And of course, we thankfully, most of our doctors or almost all of them we know our limitations. Mm-hmm. So if you do need to go somewhere else, we'll, we'll be the first ones to tell you to go somewhere else. But our goal is to expand the care as much as possible to keep the care in the community. That's excellent. Uh, Dr. Abdel Azuga, a hematologist, oncologist, Monument Health Cancer Care Institute. Thank you for coming in and talking, doctor. Thank you. Appreciate uh, yeah, this was, uh, I, I hope to have you back at any time you want to discuss uh, all of the positives that are coming out of that department for sure. Let's do it, okay? Sounds good. Thank you.